Hello, everyone. This is Barbara Hammer in New York saying hello, Teddy. Hello, 30-year-old Teddy. I'm a filmmaker. I've been a filmmaker since I was 30 years old. I'm a late bloomer. I love making work. I make paintings, the installations, performance. Uh, just let me have um, my time in my mind and allow myself the space to be creative like the Teddy is creative. Um, I enjoy making film. I'll make film until I say goodbye. But now I say hello, Teddy. Happy birthday. This is Teddy TV and we're doing an interview with Barbara Hammer. Hello, Barbara. Hi there. Thank you very much for doing this interview with us. Um, well, my first question, you've been in the film business for a very long time. You are marked as one of the queer filmmakers in history. What is queer filmmaking for you? How do you understand this term? Well, to talk about terms, um, I don't consider myself in the film business. Mm -hmm. I, I work as a film artist and um, I'm, my main goal is to always advance the language of film. Um, not to make money. That comes as the side if I'm lucky. Um, so as a queer filmmaker, I embrace all kinds of sexuality in my films. Um, that grows as people respond more and more to all kinds of possibilities. Like we don't talk about asexual. We talk about lesbian, gay, transsexual, we talk about uh, heterosexual, we talk about um, multiple partners. There, there's still more to uncover in terms of our sexuality and it's all queer. We are queering the world. Mm -hmm. well, you said in the beginning that you see yourself as a film artist, that it's not about um, commerce. Would you say that there is an inherent connection between queerness and non-commercial production? I would. Um, uh, although, yes, I would say yes, because films that are made with Hollywood standards or, uh, you know, um, broadcast standards in Europe are following a pattern. But a queer doesn't follow a pattern. A queer always has a frayed edge. It has um, a juxtaposition that you didn't expect. It takes you to a new space. Um, it's more like a rewilding Europe. It's rewilding homosexuality mm -hmm. that can never be contained. And if you have a Hollywood narrative or a documentary film that encapsulates the kind of program and schedule that we're used to, that we've been trained to see as victims of television, that is not queer. Well, that sounds like it means to you also to challenge the habits of viewing movies, of viewing film. Um, yeah? Absolutely. Absolutely. And yes. upon, uh, and does not... Uh, sorry. Yeah, you go. I'm sorry. Well, some of the times I take the film off the screen and I show it around the room, like at the uh -huh. Burger Bonhoeff when I did Changing the Shape of Film. You know, people had to walk around to see the work. Now I'm doing a, performing um, a p new piece on January 10th where I'm projecting within photographs and I'm having split images as the screen becomes the body as well as the balloon which sort of stands in for the body. But people will not see film in the expected way. So the whole space of the gallery where I'm performing it will be queered. You know, it's a wonderful um, opportunity to keep on moving, keep on challenging, keep on living. I'm so lucky. And where do you see the connection between challenging how someone views or watches a movie and challenging a lifestyle? Yes, because if we are moving while we watch a film, we have blood running through our body, we have blood running through our brain, carrying oxygen, so we are more alert than if we sit back and go to sleep watching a film unfold on television. So that means we are more politically active, we are more sensitive to our surroundings, we're more accepting of diversity, you know, we're more empathetic, we have more compassion for the refugees, 
that are flowing into Germany. Do you think it's, it's possible to, to make art, to make movies that are not personal? Because everything you say sounds very personal, very intimate in a way. Intimate, yes. Um, I think that's the best kind of movie is an intimate movie. But I don't, I think you can make movies. I've made movies about women who died for a living in the ocean since the 11th century in Korea. Diving women at Jeju-do. Um, I just finished a film on Elizabeth Bishop, the American poet, where I traveled around the world to the homes that she lived in because I feel like the architectural space we live in shapes shapes the um, the art that comes out from the poet or the filmmaker or the painter. So there are all kinds of film and one doesn't need to limit themselves to a personal expression. But I think that your own personality is going to come out even if you are um, working on a subject other than you. For instance, the diving women at Jeju-do, you know, I was changing into their dressing room into a wetsuit and they didn't believe I was a woman. So, you know, I might go like, I hold my breast and I am a woman. <laughs> um, With the Elizabeth Bishop homes, you know, sometimes it was very hard to get inside the homes and I had to sneak through the front door, you know, and take the film on the slide. But it was all about that I would do that, that I would be daring enough to break a code, to break a law, to get an image, mm -hmm. you know, or, or be confused in terms of my gender. Uh, it, it, those are things that Are, would only come from me. Something else would come from you, even if you're making a film about World War II. But doesn't that also mean that you make yourself extremely vulnerable if it's not intimate and personal? If it's not, you make yourself more intimate and vulnerable if it is personal. I think it's wonderful to be intimate and vulnerable. That's, do you know, I'm working on empathy. If we were empathetic and we wanted to know how the other felt, don't you think there would be less conflict in the world? Don't you think so? So it's good to be vulnerable. I don't want to be hidden away and, and shielded. No, I'll, I'll take the risk and what's to lose? I'm just me. You're just you. <laughs> You know, I want to love you. You want to love me. You no, know, why not? So it's also about opening up to be open to to others and to also to others' feelings. Yes, and we have to fight our training because we're trained to be self-centered. I certainly am. Hmm. You know, so I have to always be working on my heart. But it's really, I think the emotions are in the brain, not the heart. But I've been thinking a lot about this lately. Okay. Um, you won several Teddy Awards, in fact. Um, one movie I would actually like to talk with you about is Maya Darren Singh, a movie about an artist, a director, a dancer, and, well, it, it is also a movie that is a memory of her, but it's not like a typical documentary. No, it is actually several layers that are above each other. It's, it's like a collage. So I wanted to ask you, what does it actually mean to you if you think about queer archives, queer memory, what, was that a part of a queer memory in your eyes? Yes, Maya Darren. But the more important part was bringing Maya into the present again by projecting her films in the same space that she shot them in on the architectural details. For instance, I'm sh I project Meshes of the Afternoon that she shot in Los Angeles on the staircase that she's moving up and down and uh, Alexander Hamid, her partner, is filming, um, very quirky back and forth. There's a projection of her, there's an actor that looks just like her and you bring her back into her own space and, and that's, that's really archival research right there. That is like textual. It's something that you can touch and can feel if you're in the environment finding those records of the past. It's different than going to a library and looking in a box, you know, for something she owned and, and 
that's important too. But nobody thinks about the space in which we lived. And I'm looking at your apartment right now, looking <laughs> how Berlin it looks, you know. <laughs> well, it's actually the office, so it's not my apartment. <laughs> But it looks quite uh, quite like an apartment, I guess, with the pictures in the background. Um, well, and the, one of the other movies that won the Teddy Award was A Horse Is Not A Metaphor in 2009, which is also a very personal movie because it is, it is dealing with your illness. Um, how, how was that actually to put that in film? Well, when I was first... Um found to have ovarian cancer in 2009, I never thought I'd make a film of it. Um, no, this is too terrible what I'm going through. But when I finished and had a friend, a filmmaker friend come and, and film my bald head, film my scars, film me walking by a river nude and being able to actually swim, I mean, you can do quite a bit while you are undergoing chemotherapy. Um, I felt like nobody knew what chemotherapy was like, what the process was like. Therefore, I'm always working with what's invisible. I wanted to make it visible. So I went back to that footage and some that I had shot in the hospital and I made the, the many multiple times that you are given the chemotherapy as it's called therapy. Someday it'll be called poison as it really is. And someday we will look upon it as the horrible treatments that were given to people who had tuberculosis. You know, someday there will be a target for every kind of cancer and the whole body will not have to be subjected to this cell killer. Um, there was nobody else that could be in that film. You know, it had to be me. And I just showed it the other day at this um, conference on how to put empathy in documentary films. So you see, this is what I'm thinking about. Um, and I am now, as you can see, going through chemotherapy again. I had it yesterday. My next one will be next week, and I hope it's my last. And, um, and I'll be hopefully cancer-free again. Mm -hmm. um, so one suffers for life. I suffer for a future life. Well, we also hope that, that you will be cancer-free after next week, after the last chemotherapy. Um, well, one thing I found interesting about a horse is not a metaphor. I mean, it is dealing with the illness, but at the same time, it is also conveying this, this energy and this image of, of fighting, of being alive, actually, of not being someone who is threatened with death but of someone who is actually living and living to, to the maximum. Thank you for, for seeing the film. You really saw it. And um, that's what I, I tried to, one, I can't help but do that. Um, it's, oh, it's just so precious and there's so much to learn, to experience. You know, the world is so big and, you know, it, it's beyond queerness. Queerness is one little segment of it, you know. Oh, gosh, I've been reading about the evolution of the horse in paleontology, you know, and actually outside Frankfurt, there's <laughs> outside of Frankfurt, there's a very large uh, hole in the ground that has um, skeletons, more skeletons of animals, some who have never been even excavated or seen, and many horses from, you know, millions and millions, billions years ago. And it's one of the great places in the world for, um, this is what I found out last night. <laughs> so, you know, broadening, you know, still the horse, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I just thought I'd mention it since um, we're bridging the space between the U.S. and Berlin right now. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, to come back to, to the queerness, well, what did it actually mean for you to win the Teddy Award? Like, you won it several times, you, you've been in Berlin, you received the award. Um, how was that for you? You know, I've never been at the ceremony because the way the ceremony is announced is um, you have to stay until the very end. And, you know, if you're invited, you get five-day packages. 
so mine were never at the end. And sometime, <laughs> one time, uh, the last time I think, Wieland was calling me and trying to find me in Bilbao because I'd gone to see the new Guggenheim Museum. And I was reached, and it was a thrill to hear it on the phone, but there was no way I could get back to Berlin in time. So I've never had the thrill of being at the old airport, if that's where you're still going, and being in that huge crowd. I mean, I was there, but I didn't win the Teddy. It was with Nitrate Kisses when Nan Golden won over me with her film, that wonderful slide film, slideshow film. And... Um, so I had some expectations and hopes that night, but then I was given the Polar Bear Award, and I wasn't there to receive it either, because it was given the same night. <laughs> maybe, maybe it was another night, I don't know. But And now I actually have the, because um, I was in Sweden in May teaching a queer workshop, and um, Bill was able to give the sponsors the actual document um, of the Polar Bear Award, which was given for, I guess, my contribution to queer cinema. Well, the, it's actually funny that you, you've been to the ceremony and then you didn't win it, and when you won, you weren't there. When, quite ironic, isn't it? <laughs> um, but if we look at like 30 years of the Teddy Award, what would be something that you would wish for for the future of the Teddy Award? Hmm. Hmm. that they'd be given to every filmmaker. <laughs> they could be called Tedalinas. You know, they could be um, all the kinds of bears that there are. They could be the OSA Awards. Um, I think it's a great tradition, and I wish you happy birthday, Teddy. Uh, I think that it's a thrill to get one. It's always wonderful to have on your resume. You know, you're proud of it. Um, the artwork, oh my God, the sculptures that you get. <laughs> they are so funny that they really stand out on a, on a shelf, you know. Um, I just hope that the Teddy Award judges keep recognizing experimental techniques, approaches to queer cinema is where we want to go. We don't want to just be married, have the white picket fence in our children and our bank account. We want to keep opening the world. We want to keep elbowing, you know, pushing, pushing, pushing against the frame, making it move, you know. We really need to <laughs> Change cinema. Please let the Teddy support change and experiment in cinema for all of our sakes. <laughs>